And with that, I'd like to say welcome to Ethan Zhang of Neophyto Foods. Welcome, Ethan. Thanks a lot for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Was it? Uh, I don't think it was 2019. I'm going to say 2018 we met, or was it 2019? It, it, it was 2019. So okay. that's funny. Yeah, I was actually uh, I was actually having this chat with, uh, with my co-founders about like um, when when did we um, actually meet you, Craig? And it was at the CNE last year, and it's it's kind of surreal that you know the CNE was just like one year ago when obviously we didn't have a CNE this year. But uh, yeah, it's it's just a year ago. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't know, like that was, an, it was a blur to me because I've done the CNE Innovation Garage. They do the Emerging Pitch uh, Entrepreneurs Pitch Competition. I think that was my fourth year there. I, I It's hard. <laughs> I've done this for a while, so that's why I wasn't sure. But I don't know if um, that event will survive COVID because, you know, there'll be, the CNE was canceled this year. Yeah. And we'll see if it comes back next year. And if it does, you know, if it'll have a new look and feel. But, yeah, so you were there um, with your coworkers. You had a booth. Um, and those of you who um, don't know, the CNE um, used to host uh, the Emer uh, Emerging Innovators Pitch Competition every year. Um, I think it was six different uh, categories. Mm hmm and each of those categories, you pitch to win 5000 and then you pitch for the finals, and the finals gets another 25000 And if I understood correctly, if I remember, you won, your, you won your category. Yeah, we won our category. So we were in the food tech and uh, I think food tech and agriculture category. Um, so uh, I think there were maybe like six of us um, in the category. And uh, yeah, we were fortunate to win our category. Yeah, and I'm just going to go into this a little bit. There were some things you you had a very busy booth. You know, I've been I did the CNE a number of times, and people don't know what to expect, and it's never what they expect, right? Because you have a booth at the CNE, everyone really gets excited, which is great because you know literally tens of thousands of people are walking by you all weekend long, um, but. That's exactly what they're doing, walking by you all weekend long, because they're there for the C and E, right? Half of them are just let out from some event, and they're just kind of being funneled through our area, and half of them are there with kids. But you, uh, one thing you had was uh, obviously with Neophyto Foods, you had food, and that seems to always bring the crowd in. You know, always talk to people. What is what? Do you, what's your plan? You know, they, there's a bunch of people going to be walking by, and you think mm -hmm. you're going to get all their attention, but you're not. You're going to you're going to have to figure out how to get their attention because you've yeah. got all this noise. There's thousands and thousands of things competing yeah. for their attention, like the robot, uh, the robot wars that was going on in the area. That was always loud. And how many other startups? And um, yeah. So what did you find worked bringing people into your booth? Yeah. So I guess one of the main main differentiators that uh, between us and some of the other food booths is that we have free food. So free always draws people to you <laughs> like um and i guess the other thing was that well so so part of the free food is because like um at that point of time we wanted to use the cne as sort of a market test um it was actually pre uh pre-launch for us so at the point of time we had uh, a vegan cheese so a plant-based cream cheese product uh and so we wanted to essentially get a market test uh to try and see like you know what the, what, the, what the public thinks about you know, certain different kinds of flavors that we had. Uh, and so CNE was a perfect um, place to do it. And so we weren't actually selling anything because we were pre-launch. Uh, so we, it was just testing ground. So besides you know, using uh, the dangling the carrier of free food, uh, we did something that I think, I believe no one else did at the CNE, uh, at least in our year. Uh, and funny enough, that was actually my first year um, at the CNE, it's my, my first time ever. Uh, so we actually, so CNE had this like uh, set up, a booth set up where uh, they had some like metal structures that were over your heads. Uh, so we actually pasted a, a bunch of signs that said free food. Uh, but besides that, we also did like <laughs> quote unquote guerrilla marketing uh, where we pasted the same signs uh, on the ground uh, with arrows that would lead people uh, to our booth. So I think that brought a lot of food traffic uh, to our booth. 
Yeah, and families are always looking for free food. You know, you laugh, but you go to the CNE and you know when it's twelve bucks for something, and you got a family of four, or family of five. <laughs> it's it. You know, your kids are hungry. Yeah, let's just check out this free food to keep them quiet for a while. <laughs> yeah, and and it's unlimited free food for them, so you know it keeps people coming. <laughs> well, I have to say, you know, that was. Um, a very good tactic during the pitch competition is immediately when your people are on stage, somebody on your team, and I can't remember which uh, who it was, but they were out with the uh, plate of food, the crackers and the cheese in front of the yeah. judges, even before the pitch started, so people were sampling the food. Yeah. And that was very effective because, you know, it tastes really good. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and I think that definitely helped because for a food item, it's – it's very hard to imagine what it tastes like. I mean, as much as we can describe it, there's, there's just no beating, uh, sampling and tasting the actual product. So that I think that definitely helped for sure. Yeah, and you know, I was I sent you um, something the other day that said, you know, why is vegan that says vegan cheese is a crime against God or something like that, because it's all so bad. And you know, I've had so much of it. Um, I, I, fair bit of it. I'm not a vegan, but I've been to many vegan restaurants and I hang around um, a lot of vegans. So, but yeah, I usually forego the cheese, but your product is good. Why is it good? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so fun fact, I'm, I'm not a vegan as well. So a bit of background about us, uh, it's three of us, three co-founders. Uh, one of my co-founders is vegan. Uh, the other co-founder is uh, lactose intolerant. Uh, I'm the luck. I'm like, no, I, I eat everything. Uh, so, the background is that, uh, you know, the, my co-founder who's vegan, he was struggling to find a good vegan cheese because he, for him, like he's tried a bunch of vegan cheeses and the ones that he tried are either taste uh, somewhat plasticky or taste gritty. Uh, and, and he loves um, goat cheese. Like goat cheese is actually his favorite cheese. But um, when he turned, when he became vegan, like he couldn't find any uh, good cheese um, alternatives. So, that's kind of like that was kind of our starting point um, where he got uh, our other co-founder who's a food scientist by background to make him the best uh, vegan cheese best plant-based cheese possible uh, and really the starting point is where we're coming from is we try to you know replicate kind of uh, traditional cheese making so that we want to get um, as close as possible to uh, dairy cheese texture uh, and and yeah like I guess we're not really comparing ourselves to uh, vegan cheese per se, but we're actually comparing ourselves more to dairy cheese. So that's like where we, we benchmark ourselves. And so the product I tasted, is that what is now Neo cheese? Yeah, exactly. So we've uh, made uh, some improvements to it, uh, but yes, that's that was the foundation for, uh, for Neo cheese. Okay, so since people have no idea what we're talking about, why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about Neophyto Foods? Sure, sounds great. So uh, Neophyto Foods, we're a plant-based food startup uh, that aims to use food science to make plant-based versions of everyone's favorite foods. Uh, so without having to compromise on either taste, texture, uh, or sustainability. So Plant-based cheese was just a uh, first product that we came up with uh, because of you know, a personal need from one of the co-founders. Uh, and you know, that was the first product, that's the first iteration, uh, first, first, essentially the first thing that we ever launched uh, to the market. Uh, so initially when we launched it, uh, I think we launched it, yeah, January of this year. So we actually uh, launched it into the B2B segment. So to restaurants, caterers, hospitality groups. Uh, and then we add, we actually, unfortunately, we actually hit a snag uh, with our production due to COVID. Uh, so in the meantime, while we're trying to sort out uh, all these production issues, we actually launched a new product uh, in, in the middle of the pandemic. And so that is, uh, we, now we're going to call it NeoKit. So it's in the process of rebranding, but we're going to call it NeoKit. So it's the first and only plant-based meat kit in Canada. Uh, it only has five ingredients, uh, it's shelf stable, uh, without preservatives, uh, and it's very versatile. So yeah, that's kind of a short spiel about us. So I've uh, looked at your website, so I know what a meat kit is, but can you explain that to the audience? Sure. So a meat kit is essentially, uh, the way you think about it, is, it's kind of like a good food box, uh, a meal, meal kit 
company. Uh, I think people are generally quite familiar with uh, Good Food Box or HelloFresh. So meat kit for us is we provide you with the ingredients that you need to make a plant-based meat product. And the reason why it's so versatile is because uh, the ingredients are essentially dry, dry goods uh, that you can, all you have to do is you just have to add oil, add water, uh, blend it slightly, uh, and then you can shape it into anything you want. So you can shape it into a burger, you can shape it into um, nuggets, you can shape it into uh, meatballs. So it's extremely versatile. Yeah, and it looks good. How, how does it taste? It, honestly, it tastes great. So um, I have a roommate and he's, he's not a vegan. Uh, so when we were testing out a product, uh, I actually made, um, you know, Tim Hortons has those like uh, English sausage uh, breakfast muffins. So I made one of those uh, with our meat kit and he actually couldn't taste the difference. <laughs> so yeah, I think that's very nice. I think that'll be uh, very popular. So um, let's take a step back, and I like to understand, you know, who the entrepreneur was growing up. But you look pretty young still, so me, <laughs> you know, I'm an old man now, so everyone looks young to me. But were you a handful for your parents? Were you studious? Were you into music, sport, socializing? Yeah, so I actually grew up in uh, Singapore. So a bit about me: I was born in China, uh, and but I grew up in Singapore. So I moved there when I was pretty young uh, with my with my family. So my entire childhood was almost uh, exclusively in Singapore, going through schooling there, uh, finished military service. And then uh, my sort of first time living in Canada was when I went to uh, McGill for my undergrad. So growing up, I grew up in a very traditional kind of Asian household where uh, grades were almost everything. <laughs> I, I was uh, like at school, I was into uh, extracurriculars like um, table tennis, uh, track and field, rugby, and things like that. Um, so I was like, general, my interests were in sports, uh, but honestly speaking, like grades were really, really important. So uh, I did spend a lot of time studying. Uh, I did a ton of practice exams. Um, and yeah, I don't think like I was really anything, there was anything really different, like in terms of my upbringing with uh, kind of like a, a traditional Asian um, upbringing. So at what point did you know that you wanted to be an entrepreneur? Because if you're the studios t studious type, you're usually following a traditional role. Yeah, so um, so when I was thinking about undergrad, uh, I was actually thinking about, you know, should I go into finance? Uh, and if I wanted to go into finance, you know, what's, what's my path? Like, should I go down the engineering route, go for MBA, and then, you know, go to, uh, jump into finance after, or should I just do a, a undergrad in finance, which is uh, eventually what I ended up doing. Um, so I think going to McGill and like just, just getting that global perspective, uh, leaving Singapore for school was, uh, was a big change, was a big like inflection point in my life because that really exposed me to a lot of different things that um, I have not seen before. And I think especially having to you know just leave home and uh, survive or survive or like live on my own um, in a foreign country in a foreign city where uh, as well in Montreal as well like I didn't I didn't speak French so <laughs> that was also a different environment uh, so yeah I think that really sort of uh, kind of kick-started uh, this like, whole little you know, entrepreneurial spark and I, I like to kind of tell people some little bit of the stuff that I, I was doing when I was an undergrad so some of the looking back you could think of this as like, you could categorize it as slightly entrepreneurial, but I think it's actually quite, it's not very uncommon. So what I would do to kind of supplement my, my own like living expenses was I would just, you know, buy and sell used textbooks. Um, every year, you know, there's like uh, graduating students, they would try to get rid of the textbooks for extremely low price. Uh, sometimes they're like, you know what, just take it, take it for free. And I'll be like, great, I'll take it, I'll, I'll resell it. <laughs> Uh, and that would probably cover my groceries for you know a couple of weeks or something like that. Um, yeah, like I, I guess that's really my sort of first um, like foray, you know, if you will, uh, into into entrepreneurship. Um, but then you know after that, I guess going through university, um, like I actually ended up working in in private equity, so I was actually um, in private equity 
right out of uh, out of undergrad. So that was my first job, and we were evaluating like um, you know, PE funds and you know, late stage VC funds, and that I think that was truly the spark where I really thought that hey, I think this is really cool. Just like starting a company, being able to say that hey, I started something from scratch. Uh, this is this is cool, and I think there's no better time to do this, uh, to take this risk than when I'm young and I have really nothing to lose. So, there you are thinking you want to be an entrepreneur, finding the right co-founders or your or your first key team members, you know, can be crucial. So, how did you know, you know, these two, your two co-founders were the right people? Yeah. I th- I think we have a very uh, we, we are we have a very complementary skill set to be honest. So uh, one of my co-founders uh, is a food scientist, so she is sort of brains behind the product. Uh, and my other co-founder, he's uh, he's vegan, so he's really the very first like target market. He will obviously tell us like is this is is are we going down the right track or not? Um, and him you know being in that target uh target audience like he has obviously a very different um mindset in terms of like evaluating a product from us um and then for me and so their backgrounds are actually in more in science so one of them is a food science the other uh, the other one's in ecology um whereas my background is more in finance uh finance like strategy and things like that so uh, i think we were we complement each other actually pretty well but in terms of how we actually found each other, honestly, it fell into place. So, like we were all just mutual friends, <laughs> and we just fell into place. So let me, how did this happen? You say, you know, great that you fell into place. So you're all sitting around Friday night having a beer, <laughs> and uh, one of the co-founders says, you know what, uh, I'm uh, lactose intolerant now, and I need to, I need to. Uh, to figure out a cheese and the other co-founder says yeah okay i'll do that and you say yeah let's make a business out of it how, how well, like how does this how does that flow happen yeah so so it's not, actually honestly it's not too different from that so uh there's there's just one you know little backstory to that which is uh so the food scientist co-founders her name's jane uh and and the co-founder who's vegan his name's camille so jane and camille were actually doing their masters at university of guelph and while they were doing their masters there, uh, there was this competition called Project Soy, where you know it, anybody can, uh, stu- well, students there can actually make anything out of uh, soy, and take part in this competition. So you have people making stuff like uh, soy biodegradable packaging, for example. Uh, and so they decided to join, take part in the competition, and uh, make a vegan cheese out of soy. And they ended up winning the, the grad students category for that, which is which is great. Uh, and Jane and I were friends since uh, undergrad, and Jane and Camille have also been friends since undergrad. So uh, at that point in time, I still didn't know Camille yet, but uh, well, Jane and I would just like catch up, we'd like hang out and things like that. Uh, and, you know, we just talk about, keep each other update, uh, updated about our lives. Uh, and then we just talk about, you know, hey, there's this cool competition, they ended up winning it. And I was like, you know what, If it sounds great, it sounds cool. If you guys well, uh, do think about trying to commercialize this, trying to like you know uh, see if we can work something out together, try and work together, uh, let's try it out, and that's that's what happened. Uh, so you're hearing about this. Your friends are out this contest. They win this contest, and you're thinking it's a good idea. But you know, one of my sayings is opportunity cost is infinite. You know, meaning if you decide to jump in on this, you know. A vegan cheese product or a plant-based food company with your yeah. uh, friends that means you can't uh, be doing your you know the financial work you've been doing up to this point or other work so mm-hmm. why take this leap yeah I think it's a uh, it's a case of you know what do I have to lose right now um, I lose a bit of like even if it doesn't work honestly I, I lose a bit of time I don't really lose like too much um, other stuff I mean I think I have way more to gain from just like taking a leap of faith and trying it out, uh, then then I have to lose. I mean, the experience that I'm gonna gain from just getting my hands dirty, doing everything, uh, it's it's truly it's truly invaluable. So you mentioned you've had some problems during COVID. You know, has there um, have you pivoted at all, or is it just a supply chain problem? What what problems have COVID brought your business, and how have you changed as a result? 
Yeah, so our initial um, our initial starting point when we launched was we were targeting more of the B2B segment because we thought that you know, that would be a good way to uh, launch a product, get volume, uh, get to scale, and then uh, launch a B2C product because a B2C product has a bit more, uh, it's a bit more expensive in terms of branding, uh, marketing, and things like that. So uh, the initial hypothesis was not wrong in terms of, you know, we got pretty good traction with a B2B side, but obviously COVID hit, uh, all of our B2C, B2B um, clients essentially either closed down or operating on reduced capacity. Uh, so that kind of killed um, the B2B side of quite a bit. And so the pivot that we really made was uh, we accelerated that move uh, into B2C. Uh, so, and we also introduced a new product because of uh, supply chain issues with, uh, with the vegan cheese. So this is a new, it's a new product and our new starting point is, is B2C. So right now we're actually doing e-commerce, we're doing direct consumer uh, marketing, we're doing brand building and, and things like that. So who is your ideal client now? Yeah, so we have a we have a few different groups. Uh, obviously, the you know the vegans, the vegetarians are uh, definitely going to be ideal clients. But interestingly, uh, and I think I'm I'm also realizing this from my own friend group, which is uh, there are a lot of flexitarians um, these days. Like they're just people who uh, want to consume more plant-based um, products and reduce consumption of animal-based products for a variety of reasons. It could be for health, it could be for environment, uh, it could be for sustainability, animal welfare, anything. But it's it's getting a lot more um, prevalent these days. Yeah, and I, um, so everyone talks about hustle. So what are you doing to build your audience? You're just bringing people over and having parties and say, sharing your cheese and then just, you know, buy one, buy a pack, couple packs on the way out? Well, how are you getting your uh, word out? Yeah, you know, you know what? That, that would be ideal. <laughs> Unfortunately, we can't do that right now. Um, so CNE was a good example. If we could do that, give out free samples, we would 100% do it. Yeah, a lot of people would have bought at the CNE. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but right now, honestly, it's just like focusing on um, getting the word out, working out like you know, how do we get how do we get marketing to work? How do we get like pay marketing to work? How do we get content marketing to work for us? Uh, when we were doing B two B, you know, it, it, the hustle was in terms of doing outbound marketing, so a lot of like co outreaches, uh, just like cold calls, cold emails, and things like that. Uh, so yeah, you just gotta keep finding out, keep grinding, keep finding out you know, what's gonna work for um, for you. And how's that going? Like, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, I won't say there's a lot, but there is some competition in this area, uh, definitely for mind share. So, you know, how do you get people who maybe are aware of these other products or aren't aware of these other products to start thinking about you instead of, you know, what they would eat normally or trying something? What What's the go-to strategy? Showing recipes, attracting with a different, like, what, what's uh, working? Yeah, so recipes for sure because uh, we know that like we like just just for the meat kit, right? Like we provide a meat kit, but uh, it's not it's not gonna be like super apparent to everyone uh, in terms of what you can actually use it for, how do you actually use it. So we do provide a number of recipes uh, on our website, and I think when we think about kind of the the landscape, uh, fundamentally. Fundamentally, our product is a bit different from you know existing products on the market because uh, most of the existing, most if not all of the existing products on the market, uh, they are available in grocery stores. They are refrigerated, uh, and they just they obviously they have like different people have different pain points with them. So whether it's like you know, there's too many uh, ingredients in them, uh, there's like preservatives. Uh, it's like it doesn't taste, there's like a, some aftertaste and things like that. Um, so different people have different pain points of it. And from kind of the, the surveys and research that we've been doing, we try to really uh, hit home uh, our value prop, which is trying to address those pain points that people have. So is meal kit a subscription-based thing where you get so many per month or is it I just order a like a bag? Right now, it's a uh, it's not a subscription based, so it's more like an e-commerce uh, e-commerce based product. Uh, we are trying to get into source. We are talking to a couple of source, 
uh, but we realized that you know the, the initial feedback from our MVP was that um, the packaging uh, it's it's it looks great but it might not be the most um, retail friendly so that's something that we are working on right now hopefully we'll get uh, a new retail friendlier packaging uh, in maybe four to six weeks yeah I'm just gonna throw it to the chat room what would you think about a you know a subscription box where you get the meal the meat kit uh, a couple of recipe cards and a few extra ingredients to build your uh, recipes for the month and uh, you know here you go here's your pasta recipe here's this here's that and uh, how to make it and you know you get new recipes every month in the in your box let us know if you'd be interested in that in the chat room we'll just do a little impersonal uh, poll here have you tried uh, talking to people about that yeah we've gone we've gotten some uh, suggestions around that around subscription model uh, it's something that we would definitely consider because it's it's definitely something that's quite interesting and I, I know there are a lot of like you know successful subscription based e-commerce companies um, but I think for us to successfully you know execute that we definitely need um, a variety so variety whether it's like in terms of uh, horizontally or vertically uh, whether it's different flavors or different recipes for, with the same product. Yeah, we've got uh, both. The, we only had two replies so far, but they all said they'd try that and it'd be a good idea. So I don't know if people are interested. That way they don't have to go back shopping. You're giving them new recipes all the time. Mm -hmm. I, it's a little work, uh, um, and it, you might not be ready for it now, maybe six months down the road once you get all that feedback. But just thoughts. Yeah, yeah. that's great feedback. Um, so if people, how are you getting the word out now? You're doing Facebook ads, social media like, how do people find you? Just randomly on the website? Are they in vegan magazines? Yeah, right now we're doing a lot of uh, brand building, content marketing. So primarily on Instagram, Facebook, uh, and and paid marketing as well. So uh, Facebook ads, Instagram ads. Uh, recently, we also had a uh, we were part of this like um, Stack Financials, Stack Finance. Uh, they had a support local campaign, so um, we had a partnership with them on that as well. Um, yeah, I would say that for now, primarily, it's, it's really just social media. That's where um, we've been doing a lot of, uh, we've been building a lot of our audience, uh, providing our audience with a lot of uh, content, whether it's educational content, scientific content, or uh, food-related content uh, with regards to like recipes and things like that. So since you've pivoted um, to, you know, meal kit, how has, um, has your audience or your targeting changed at all? Like, obviously, you're going from B to B to B to C, but mm -hmm. um, other, like, are you still targeting specifically vegan? You, tar you mentioned flexitarians. Are you doing marketing yeah. towards that now? Yeah, so uh, the targeting is a bit different. Uh, when we were doing B to B, actually, we didn't, we didn't really focus uh, at all on social media because uh, you won't really see kind of restaurant owners following uh, their suppliers uh, on social media, for example. Uh, so we yeah, we didn't really use social media at all, but now uh, it's it's crucial. Uh, it's crucial for us because that's where a lot of our engagement happens. That's where uh, we work with influencers. That's where we have people asking us questions in terms of the product, like whether it's gluten-free, whether it's you know, preservative-free and things like that. Um, so we try to uh, engage uh, with our audience actively uh, on our social media or through our website. So you've been doing this for a little while now. Uh, do you have any tips for founders? I would say um, execution, it's, it's crucial. I, anybody can have uh, a good idea, and I think a lot of people have great ideas, but uh, it just comes down to um, how do you execute on it? Uh, and just having uh, sort of like having the will, having the drive to to go through with it uh, and see if it works. And honestly, the, the only way to know if it works is to test it out. Uh, whether, you know, you get your friends to test it out, you get uh, uh, other random people to test it out. As long as you get someone to test it out, get some feedback, then iterate on it. Um, and I think the other, the other really key learning point that I've learned is that it's, it's a completely different thing when you have people interested in your product uh, versus people who are willing to buy your product. So those are, I think, those are two um, very different concepts that you know didn't really hit me until until we started selling selling stuff. Which is, you know, yeah, there's a lot of people who say that, hey, I will buy it, I will buy it, 
but until they actually buy it, you don't we don't really know if if your product works. Yeah, uh, like uh, Sean Weiss would say, money talks, right? You know, uh, otherwise, liking your product is not the same thing as buying your product. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it it it. It's a false positive a lot of times for entrepreneurs when they're early on. They're like, oh, I, I could sell it to everybody in the room. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but the, the true test is how many you can actually sell for. And, you know, we met at a pitch competition and mm -hmm. you've been doing this. You've done some pivoting now. How important is being able to pitch uh, for entrepreneurs? It's uh, to us, it's extremely important um, because so far to this day, we've actually bootstrapped our business. Uh, so pitch competition winnings are actually uh, very crucial to our daily operations. Uh, and I think in general, you know, as an entrepreneur, as a founder, uh, you need to be able to uh, quote unquote sell. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean you, know, you are selling a product the entire time. You are selling uh, whether it's you know, your company or your brand, um, or just like your personality, like everyone is attracted to a different kind of personality. Everyone's attracted to a uh, different kind of brand, different kind of uh, values, what do you stand for? So, which is why I say, you know, quote unquote, it's, it's quote unquote sell because it's more of uh, like a display of uh, who you really are uh, that really attracts um, the kind of people, the kind of audience that uh, will be attracted to, to who you are. Yeah, I, I like to say, um... But it's not only pitching, it's not just to get money or whatnot, but it, pe investors and whatnot are evaluating you, whether, you know, your leadership, can you deliver a message that people will follow? You know, will you be able to hire the best people? Will you be able to get partners on board? Will you be able to? And so they're evaluating all those things. So definitely, um, I, I'm glad you touched on that. Yeah, so, exactly. Do you have any advice on uh, startups seeking advisors? Yeah, so we, I think we are very fortunate to have had um, a number of advisors helping us along the way, and, and we are truly grateful for that. Um, I think some, from some of our experience, uh, you know, we, nobody knows your business um, better than you. And I think that's probably generally uh, what I've also uh, heard from, from other founders as well. Uh, advisors have a ton of experience like i have to say this like advisors are advisors for a reason like they're industry experts they've been in the industry for you know 20 plus years 10 plus years uh and there are you know certain ways of doing things there are obviously different relationships uh experience that they'll bring uh, but ultimately at the end of the day when it comes down to execution when it comes down to prioritization uh like we are the ones who have to decide like you know what advice are you gonna take? Like you have a lot of advice, but how do you actually prioritize them? What's important, what's high impact, what's uh, easily achievable, but also high impact at the same time. Uh, so it comes down to, you know, uh, trying to uh, orga get organized uh, on all of these advices that uh, you're getting from advisors. Sorry, but that I was muted. So you have to be careful when you're talking to lots of different advisors because they'll give you lots of different advice. So, and um, yeah, you have to decide. You are the ultimate. You know your business better than anyone. You know your customers, or at least you should, better mm -hmm. than anyone. And you can decide to do the opposite thing. So, you know, sometimes zagging instead of zigging is the way to go. <laughs> if yeah. someone says this is, yeah, because, oh, that's counterintuitive, but that's what everybody will do. So why don't I do this over here? So it's, it's um, advisors are there to give you advice, to um, hopefully give you insights into things you didn't have. So you can take away and, you know, and challenging you in ways that you, you wouldn't have done otherwise. And then you can take away and make the decisions and, and drive the growth of your company. But, you know. I often, you know, will give advice to people and then say, listen, I'm not your target market, though. So, yeah, go, go you better go talk to them. Like, you know, because uh, yeah. I, I, some of this stuff doesn't make like there's a lot of startups I work with that. Yeah, that product doesn't make or service doesn't make sense to me. But, mm -hmm. you know, if your target market's loving it, then let's go for it. Yeah. But honestly, actually, now that you're, you're talking about this point, you know, I think there is value talking to people who are actually not in your target market because uh, like 
initially, you know, when you come when you try and hypothesize, you know, what's your target market? Uh, honestly speaking, like you don't have a clear answer. Like you have a hypothesis as to what a high target market is, but when you try and talk to people who you think that are not your target market, that will either solidify your hypothesis or it could disprove your hypothesis. Uh, let's say you know you let's say you know you might you might say that you're not a target audience for someone else, but uh, in the conversation, you could this person could realize that oh yeah, you know you are truly not my target audience, or you know what maybe you are borderline, or you could someday be my target audience, and that really helps to uh, make the the whole like value prop and target audience a bit more um, clear and concise. Yeah, and by talking to people who are outside your target audience, you could also find different niches, different value propositions for different uh, buyer personas that you never thought of before. So definitely talk to as many people as you possibly can. Yeah, agree for sure. So what's next for you and Neophyto Foods? Yeah, so for us, uh, we just launched our new kit, uh, so the Miki product, about uh, four weeks, five weeks ago. Uh, right now, for us, the key is getting the word out to as many people as we can uh, about the Neo Kit because you know we like personally, I, like I I think this it's a really cool product. Uh, Jane, I don't know how Jane came up with it, but she's brilliant. Um, so uh, we need to get the word out definitely to a lot more people. Uh, next, uh, the next thing is you know we need to finish our rebrand, uh, repackaging get it into stores so we are able to serve uh, different people different in different areas uh, and the next uh, the other priority is you know getting new cheese back online so uh, that is looking promising we should have it back online within the next month uh, if not the next uh, two months uh, we see we see the light at the end of the tunnel so we're, we're very excited for that uh, we've been getting inbounds uh, just from from retailers asking, you know, hey, where when can we get a new cheese? Because they they've tried it before, like we've given them samples before, uh, and and they're just waiting <laughs> to to have it on. Well, it's great to be in demand, um, and you know, knowing that it'll be limited stock, you can take some pre-orders potentially, you know, and drive a little business that way. Um, also, if you got a B two C business going, you know, uh, offering your additional uh, your consumers the cheese product as well, and if you're doing a subscription box, <laughs> yeah. you can offer you know the the cheese as part of the recipe. With yeah, it all works out really well. Yeah, exactly. That's uh, that's something that actually we are thinking about right now. Um, I think I believe that we have a recipe that's in the works that will combine uh, the two products. So I'm personally I'm very excited to see uh, how it works together. And there's a lot of cheese logs and cheese balls uh, around Christmas time, so in the holiday season. Mm-hmm. Um, so you might be able to uh, um, capture some of that market. Yeah, we are, we're excited because uh, holiday season is definitely a big one. And uh, yeah, we're, we're thinking of doing something special. So you know, keep your eyes peeled for, uh, for some holiday specials. Value, fabulous. And if people want to find out more, check out your products, maybe even go online and order, where do they go? Yeah, so you can go to our website. It's neophytofoods.com. Uh, uh, so it's N-E-O-P-H-Y-T-O and then foods.com. Um, yeah, our website's there. Uh, we have uh, you know products there. We have recipes. Uh, and we also have uh, fantastic blog articles just uh, educating just some educational articles on, you know, like whether it's soy or sustainability or even like omega-3. And I just put the link in the chat room. So thank you very much for uh, taking the time uh, to come out today. Hopefully when we're doing live events again, we'll get you to come out. Um, actually, where are you located? Yeah, so I'm I'm located in uh, Toronto. Uh, okay. Jane's actually located in Guelph. So our previous uh, production facility was actually in Guelph. Uh, so yeah, we're... we're predominantly like we're distributed but we're Ontario based yeah and before we just hang up have you worked with any of the food incubators to uh, see about the kitchen I know the Toronto uh, city of Toronto has one and that kind of stuff um, I think the only one, I think I know of a couple um, there was one before it was called food starter but it's, yep. yeah I think it got acquired by um, maybe like the street benches kitchens um, so I know there are a couple around. We haven't really looked at them before uh, because, like, we've uh, we've had better, well, not better. We've had like other options that were a bit more convenient, just because they're like closer to Guelph. 
Um, so, so yeah, we're definitely like, as we scale up, we're definitely going to look into those. Um, a yeah. Bit more. The big advantage is obviously, you know, access to the big kitchens to help you uh, create your products. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. Oh, and uh, sorry, I think I forgot to mention this when I was uh, <laughs> when I was mentioning the website. But uh, for for the Toronto Stars um, audience, we actually have a, uh, a discount code. Uh, so if you just use uh, Toronto Starts, uh, that's a ten percent off until uh, end of September. All lowercase. Uh, all caps. Uh, all caps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, there's a discount code for everyone who goes and checks it out. Again, thank you very much for taking the time to be on Startup Talk today. I uh, appreciate it. I know you're part of our uh, community on Slack. People can join us there. And everyone should check out New Fido Foods, the new cheese, and the meat kit um, and try something new and exciting and support local startups. This has been great. Um, and we'll be chatting soon. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Craig. It's a great time.